Today, I want to talk to you about a topic that's close to my heart, the power of the mind. You see, many people believe that luck is the determining factor in success, that if you're lucky enough, you'll become rich and achieve all your dreams. But I'm here to tell you that luck won't make you rich. Your mind will. You know, I've spent a lot of time diving deep into understanding how our minds work. And let me tell you, it's been quite the journey. What I've found is nothing short of amazing. Our thoughts and feelings, they're like the steering wheel of a big ship. They guide us through the waters of life, shaping the course of our journey. Think about it like this. Every thought we have, every emotion we feel, it's like dropping a pebble into a pond. The ripples from that pebble, they spread out and touch everything around them. In the same way, our thoughts and feelings send out waves of energy that ripple through our lives, affecting everything from our relationships to our health to our success. But here's the thing. Most of us go through life without really understanding the power we hold in our minds. We let our thoughts and feelings run wild, like a herd of wild horses without a rider. But when we learn to harness that power, when we take control of our thoughts and emotions, that's when the magic really happens. Imagine you're driving a car. If you don't have your hands on the steering wheel, you're just careening down the road, bouncing off obstacles left and right. But when you grab hold of that wheel and steer with purpose, you can navigate your way to your destination with ease. Now, I know you might be curious, thinking, how does all this stuff really work? Well, let me break it down for you in simple terms. Think of your thoughts as little sparks of electricity in a vast field. Kind of like when you flip a light switch and the bulb lights up. These thoughts, they have power, they have energy. But that's not all. Our emotions, they're like magnets. They have this pull, this force that draws things towards us. You know when you're really happy or excited about something? It's like you're radiating this energy out into the world and it's attracting good things back to you. Let's break it down even more. Imagine you have a clear goal in mind, like getting a promotion at work or finding your dream home. That's your intention, your thought. Now imagine you feel really excited and happy about achieving that goal. That's your elevated emotion. When you put those two together, your clear intention and your elevated emotion, it's like you're sending out this strong magnetic signal to the universe. It's like you're saying, hey, I really want this and I'm super excited about it. And the universe, it hears you. It responds to that energy you're putting out there. And here's the really cool part, that signal you're sending out, it doesn't just disappear into thin air. It actually influences everything around you your relationships, your opportunities, even your health and well-being. It's like you're creating this ripple effect in the universe, and it's coming back to you in all sorts of amazing ways. So, when you combine clear intention with elevated emotion, you're basically tapping into this incredible power within yourself. You're becoming a magnet for the things you want in life. And the more you practice this, the more you focus your thoughts and emotions on what you truly desire, the stronger that magnet becomes. Practicing meditation and visualization isn't just sitting still and imagining things. It's like exercising your brain, just like how you exercise your muscles when you play sports or run around outside. When we practice these techniques, we're actually training our minds to focus on the things we want to achieve in life. Imagine your brain is like a garden. If you want beautiful flowers to grow, you have to plant seeds and water them regularly. In the same way, when we meditate and visualize our goals, we're planting seeds of success in our minds. We're feeding our brains with positive thoughts and images like sunshine and water for our mental garden. But it's not just about thinking happy thoughts. It's about rewiring our brains to think and feel in ways that support our success. You see, our brains are like supercomputers. They're constantly processing information and making connections. And when we repeatedly focus on our goals and dreams, our brains start to create new pathways, like little trails in the garden leading straight to our desired destination. 
Think of it like building a bridge. At first, it might seem like a daunting task, but if you keep laying down one brick at a time, eventually you'll have a sturdy bridge that can take you wherever you want to go. That's what happens in our brains when we practice meditation and visualization consistently. We're building bridges to our dreams, one thought at a time. And the amazing thing is, when we do this consistently, incredible things start to happen. It's like planting a seed and watching it grow into a beautiful flower. Suddenly, opportunities start to appear out of nowhere. You might meet someone who can help you achieve your goals, or you might stumble upon a new idea that leads to success. But it's not just about luck. It's about the power of your mind. When you train your brain to focus on your goals and dreams, you're actually programming it to attract success into your life. It's like sending out a signal to the universe that says, I'm ready for success. But it's not just about positive thinking. It's about aligning our thoughts, emotions, and actions with our goals. It's about stepping into the feeling of already having achieved what we desire. Success isn't just something that happens by chance. It's not like finding a lucky penny on the sidewalk. It's about something much deeper. Discipline, commitment, and perseverance. Let's break it down. Discipline means sticking to a plan, even when you don't feel like it. It's about setting goals and working towards them step by step. It's like following a recipe when you're baking a cake. You have to measure out the ingredients and follow the instructions carefully if you want the cake to turn out just right. Commitment is another key ingredient in the recipe for success. It means making a promise to yourself and sticking to it no matter what. It's like making a vow to yourself to exercise every day or to study for a test until you know the material inside and out. Commitment means staying true to your goals even when the going gets tough. And then there's perseverance. This is all about never giving up, even when things seem impossible. It's like climbing a mountain. You might encounter obstacles along the way, like steep cliffs or slippery rocks. But if you keep putting one foot in front of the other and keep pushing forward, eventually you'll reach the summit. Success is also about showing up every single day and putting in the work, even when it's hard. It's about rolling up your sleeves and getting your hands dirty. It's like being a farmer who tends to their crops day in and day out, rain or shine. You have to water the plants, pull out the weeds, and nurture them with care if you want them to grow and flourish. But perhaps most importantly, success is about believing in yourself and your ability to create the life you want. It's about having faith in your own potential and knowing that you have what it takes to achieve your dreams. It's like having a compass that points you in the direction of your goals, even when the path ahead seems unclear. So, if you want to become rich, don't wait for luck to come knocking on your door. Take control of your mind and your destiny. Set clear goals, visualize your success, and take inspired action every day. You got to connect, you got to experience, you got to be present. All of these things are important elements. So, so that was the first thing. The second thing was that they realized that it was the mismanagement of their emotions and the hormones of stress that really began to create their condition. Now, now stress is when your brain and body are knocked out of balance. The stress is when your body's not that of homeostasis. We have an innate mechanism in our body that returns us back to order. So then if you're someone cuts you off on the LA freeway, you have a emotional reaction. But 15 minutes later, you're back to driving and you're over it right? That's all organisms in nature can tolerate short-term stress. But when it's all day long, all week, all year. So if you're reacting to like a Tyrannosaurus, Rex is chasing you, you have to make a decision. Am I going to use 20% of my energy? I'm going to use 100%. So it turns out when you're reacting to traffic, 200%. All right, or if you're reacting to your coworker sitting in the cubicle next to you, 
you're, you're turning on that response and what was once very adaptive becomes very maladaptive because when you turn on the stress response and you can't turn it off, now you're headed for disease because nobody can live in emergency mode for that extended period of time. Well, human beings, we can turn on the stress response just by thought alone. You can think about your problems and you're producing the same biological effects. So those chemicals give the brain and body a rush of energy and people become addicted to that rush of energy. So now they use the problems and conditions in their life to reaffirm their addiction to that emotion. They need the bad job. They need the poor relationship. So that means they become addicted to the life that they don't even like. Why do we, why do we need the bad job or bad relationship and stay stuck because it's a conditioned response? So listen, if you get angry at a coworker and all of a sudden you get an arousal in your brain and body, right? You get a rush of energy. When you start noticing that your body starts dropping, your brain starts noticing your energy starts dropping, you're automatically going to have the image of the coworker in order to what give your body the next old the jolt. Right? So all of a sudden people become addicted to their own thoughts, right? So these people realize that, oh my God, um, I, I've been mismanaging my attention and energy and I got it. I got to get beyond my past. I got to get beyond these emotions. I got to make some big changes. I got to break the habit of being myself. You know, I got to stop being this person. Now that sounds really good, theoretically and philosophically, but change is such a hard thing. All right, because the moment you come back to your senses and you step back into your life and you see that person where you go to that place or you're with that experience, so many people are unconsciously reacting in their thoughts and feelings to everything in their environment. So now their environment is controlling how they think and feel. So they realize that in order to change, it'll change the environment. They got to be greater than their environment, greater than the conditions in the world in the circumstances, be mindful of that every time they come up to be like, yeah, I'm going to think differently, right? I'm not going to react. Yeah, right. I'm not going to go back. I'm not going to go back. Because the moment you start reacting emote emotionally, emotions are a record of the past. And if those emotions are driving your thoughts, you're thinking in the past. And if you can't think greater than how you feel and you believe your thoughts have something to do with your destiny, you're creating more of your past, right? So it turns out that the repetition of thinking and feeling and feeling and thinking, these loops that people get caught in condition their body to subconsciously become the mind of that emotion, which means now their body is their unconscious mind is believing they're living in the same past experience 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. I kind of moved past the word visualization because I think it kind of conjures up a little bit too much of a spiritual association. The word that's used in science is called mental rehearsal and mental rehearsal. There's two types of mental rehearsal. There's what's called internal mental imaging, which means you're in the scene as the first person experiencing it. And then there's called external mental imaging, which is you're observing yourself in the scene. Turns out that when you are actually in the first person or not the third person, that action of rehearsing what you're doing produces the strong biological change. Now let's talk about this. You can take a group of people that have never played the piano before and you can do a functional brain scan on them and then you can teach them one-handed scales and chords and they'll practice those chords two hours a day for five days at the end of five days they grow a whole new set of circuits on the opposite side of the brain well that makes sense you learn something new learning is making new synaptic connections you get your body involved with some instruction when you get your body involved you're going to have a new experience experience enriches the brain you pay attention to what you're doing you got to pay attention yes they present and if you repeat it over and over again, firing and wiring, firing and wiring, you assemble new networks of neurons equal to your experience and nothing new there. But you can take a group of people and you can have them close their eyes to a brain scan on them before the experiment. Five days later, do a brain scan after. 
and for two hours a day, they mentally rehearse playing those scales and chords at the end of five days. They grow the same amount of circuits in their brain as the people actually physically doing the exercise. So what's the relevance? Number one, when you're truly focused and you're truly paying attention. Your brain does not know the difference between what's going on out there and what's going on in here. So the thought becomes the experience and the brain looks like it's been playing the piano for the last five days. But they never lifted a finger now from a biological standpoint. Our brains are a record of the past. They're an artifact of everything we've learned and experienced to this moment when we prime the brain to change its circuitry before the experience. Now the brain is no longer a record of the past. It's now a map to the future. And so as we warm up those brain circuits, it's more easy for us to slip into a supernatural behavior. If you take those people and you set them from the piano and they've never played the piano before, but they've been mentally rehearsing for the last five days, they'll play those scales and chords. Like magic, they just learned how to do it just by changing their internal state. Take a group of men, you can have them close their eyes and for an hour, day mentally rehearse doing bicep curls over and over again, and they add an emotional component called harder, stronger, more intense, and they put themselves in that first person internal mental image at the end of two weeks. They have a 13.5 increase in muscle strength, and they've never performed the activity. Not only is the brain changed to look like the experience has already occurred, now the body has changed by thought alone. You see, going from the old self to the new self is the neurological, is the biological, is the chemical, the hormonal genetic death of the old self. People who say to me, I'm in the river of change, I'm in the unknown, I'm in this void, I can't predict my future. I always say the same thing to them. The best way to predict your future is to create it. Not from the known, but from the unknown. What thoughts do you want to fire and wire in your brain? You can't wait for your wealth to feel abundance. You can't wait for your success to feel empowered. You can't wait for the mystical moment to feel awe. You can't wait for your new relationship to feel love or your new job to feel gratitude. It's the old model of reality, of cause and effect, waiting for something outside of you to change how you feel inside of you. When you feel differently inside of you, you pay attention to whoever or whatever caused that. And that event in and of itself is called a memory to wait for our environment to give us relief. The quantum model of reality is about causing an effect, which means when you feel whole, you begin to heal. When you feel empowered, you're going to be successful. When you're worthy enough, you'll feel abundant. When you are in love with life and in love with yourself, you will find an equal or it will find you. And when you are in awe of the moment, the mystical is going to bless you in a way that you never anticipated. And when you are in a state of gratitude, your job is on the way. It's causing an effect. And by the way, what is the emotional signature of gratitude? Don't you give thanks when you get something or you receive something? So then, what if you were to begin to give thanks or feel thanks before it manifested? Would your body as the unconscious mind believe it's in the future experience in the present moment? Because gratitude is the ultimate state of receivership. And so we don't pray in our work to have our prayers answered. We get up as if our prayers are already answered. It is that state of mind and body that I know that requires a clear intention and an elevated emotion. And the clear intention is an act of the mind and the brain, and an elevated emotion is when you open your heart. When you combine those two elements, you just moved from living in your past to living in your future. So then, here's the question. Can you believe in a future that you can't see or experience with your senses yet, but you've thought about enough times in your mind that your brain is literally changed to look like the experience has already occurred? Can you fall in love with a future potential that already exists in the quantum field? And how many potentials exist in the quantum field? Infinite potentials in the quantum field.
Can you select a new potential in the quantum field and emotionally embrace that future reality before it's made manifest to such degree that your body as the unconscious mind is believing it's living in that future reality in the present moment and you're signaling new genes and new ways? If there's physical evidence, physical evidence in your brain and body to look like the experience has already happened, there's evidence there physically, by thought alone. Relax, because the experience is going to find you. There's an intelligence that's giving you life right now. It's keeping your heart beating and digesting your food and organizing trillions of functions in every single cell of your body. It's organizing mutations in your DNA. There's some invisible force that's giving you life, but that same intelligence that's keeping your heart beating and digesting your food is the same intelligence that's creating supernovas in distant galaxies and causing flowers to bloom. It's both personal and universal. It's within you, and it's all around you, and you can't see it, and you can't smell it, and you can't taste it, and you can't feel it, but it is the giver of life, and it is a consciousness and consciousness is awareness, and awareness is paying attention, and it is the observer observing you into life. And you know when I tell our advanced students, either you're gonna be defined by a vision of the future or the memories of the past. And then people say, why are you so bitter? Why are you so frustrated? Why are you suffering so much? And your brain, in that emotion, you're in the emotion, which means you're in the chemical residue of the past, is going to call up the event because you're emotionally connected to it. And you're going to say, I'm this way because of that past experience. So then imagine what I do with people. We have people that have been abused. We have people that have been traumatized, that have been assaulted. We have people that have had very, very difficult, difficult pasts. And have you ever heard me say to revisit the event? Have you ever heard me say that? Never do we need to revisit the event because once you do, you open the box. But what we want to do is overcome the emotion because that's just what's lasting from the event. So you sit a person down and the moment you sit them down, what do you think the body is going to do? It's going to look for something to recreate that emotion because that's the person's identity. Are you with me still? So if I make the person, if I inspire the person to sit there and they're sitting there and all of a sudden they're noticing that they're hot and they're irritated and their stomach is twisting and all of a sudden it's a group of sensations, a group of feelings that they have called all along frustration. But the different sensations, the moment you name it, it becomes an emotion. But what it is, is just bodily sensations. It's energy that's stuck in the body. So the body is looking to go back to the past. It's believing it's in the past. Are you with me still? So if the person becomes aware that their body is doing that, and like training an animal, allow the body to feel that emotion and then settle it down into the present moment. When you settle it down into the present moment, the body starts to trust the present moment and move out of the past. And there's a release of energy. Then the body goes, wait a second, what's gonna happen in the next moment? And it starts doing that. And it starts to try anticipate the future. And you settle the body back down into the present moment. And every time you do that, you're telling the body it's no longer the mind that you're the mind and your will is getting greater than the program. And all of a sudden you start to lower the volume to that emotion. And when you begin to break the addiction to that emotion, the side effect of breaking that addiction is called joy. It's called freedom. All of a sudden the body's saying, I don't wanna be tormented anymore. Now does that mean you shouldn't grieve over things that you lose? Grieving is a biological process. It's neural pruning. It's a death of circuitry. It's a death of emotions. It's the absence of void of something in your life. And that's important. In grief sooner or later, you've gotta to come to a greater understanding about death, a greater understanding about loss, a greater understanding so that you can adapt to those conditions. Every time I sit with someone and they start complaining about their life and I let them go for a few minutes and then I go, oh, you know what I say to them? You only complain about your life when it's not working. And the emotion that you're feeling right now is keeping you connected to the past. 
You never do this when your life is working. And so I don't have a problem with moving through the stages of emotions. But I also know that what a person really wants more than anything else is to be free. People want to be free. And I have witnessed transformation. It was so alive in their mind that they began to live as if that future reality was happening in the present moment. So here's my question. Can you believe in a future that you can't see or experience with your senses yet, but you've thought about enough times in your mind that your brain is literally changed to look like the event has already occurred? The latest research in neuroscience says you can change your brain from living in the past to living in the future. And can you fall in love with that vision to such a degree that you come out of your resting state and change guilt or suffering into inspiration and joy and gratitude? To such a degree that your body, as the unconscious mind, does not know the difference between that external event and what you're creating internally, so that your body believes it's living in that future, in the present moment, and you begin to signal new genes in new ways to change your body, to look like the event has already occurred. The latest research in epigenetics says you can change your body by thought alone. Now reason this with me. If there's physical evidence in your brain and body to look like the event has already occurred, your brain and body are no longer living in the past, they're living in the future, and you will walk right into your vision, something new you wanted to experience. And the moment you started thinking about this experience, the moment you started contemplating this potential reality, you turned on a part of your brain called the frontal lobe, the crowning achievement of the human being. It's 40% of your entire brain. It is the creative center and it has connections to all other parts of the brain. And the moment you said, what would it be like to be a leader? What would it be like to be successful? What would it be like to have this vision come true? The moment you asked that open-ended question, you turned on this part of the brain because the rest of the brain is just a bunch of automatic programs. And now the frontal lobe, the creative center, wakes up and it has connections to the entire brain. It's the CEO, it's the boss, it's the symphony leader of the brain. And the moment you get creative, the frontal lobe begins to select different networks of neurons that are stored in your brain from things you've learned or experienced. And as you begin to think a what if question, it begins to select these different networks and begins to seamlessly piece them together and making your brain fire in new sequences and in new patterns and new combinations. And whenever you make your brain work differently, you're changing your mind because mind is the brain in action. Mind is the brain at work. And the moment those neurons fire in tandem, you get a picture in your mind, a hologram, a vision. For those people who are passionate, that thought that their thinking begins to create an elevated emotion. They become inspired. They feel enthusiastic. They become passionate. They started to open their hearts. And all of a sudden, they're combining a clear intention with an elevated emotion. And it's the combination of a clear intention and an elevated emotion in our research over and over again that proves then the person now is changing fundamentally, changing biologically, changing internally. And their brain and body are moving from living in the past into living in the future. When you do that, when you had that moment, you came out of your resting state and then you started to write down all the things you were going to do to get to that vision, all the choices you were going to make, all of the experiences or goals you wanted to achieve, and all of the emotions and the joy you would feel. And when you were doing that, you were setting your sights towards that destiny. And then you did something really brilliant. You wrote down the choices you weren't going to make. You became aware of the behaviors you weren't going to demonstrate. You began to review certain experiences you wanted to stay away from. And then you looked at the emotions that would bring you to a lower level. And you began to separate the old self from the new self. And when you begin to do that and you're observing the old self, it means you're no longer the program. Now you're the consciousness observing the program. And that's when you begin to objectify your subjective self. And so the moment you stop making the same choices that you always make, get ready because it's going to be uncomfortable. And that's the moment you're heading towards the new self. 
Do you think that you can change the circuits in your brain by thinking about it? So I did this experiment a little ways back. It took these people who never played the piano before, and they separated them into four categories. And they said, listen, we're going to scan your brains before you learn this exercise, and then we're going to scan your brain after. And all you have to do is show up for two hours a day and practice for two weeks, okay? And just follow the instructions. And we're gonna hook your brain up to these sophisticated scans, and we're gonna see what happens before and after. So they got with these people and they said, okay, first group, here's the scales and here's the chords. They're one-handed exercises. Practice them over and over again. Keep playing them. So they played every single day, two hours a day for two weeks. They scanned their brains before, they scanned their brains after. After two weeks, guess what happened? whole new set of circuits lit up in their brain that never lit up before. That makes sense. You learn something new. Learning is making new connections. Repeating it over and over again is sustaining or maintaining those connections, and that's called memory. So they memorized what they were doing by physically practicing or personalizing what they learned. Make sense? Yes. Standard. Simple. It took the second group of people and they said, listen, we want you to play two hours a day for two weeks. We're going to scan your brain before and after. You know what we're going to do? We're not gonna tell you how to play anything. You just come and do whatever you want. Play whatever you want. So at the end of two weeks, guess what happened to them? Nothing. You know why? Because they couldn't remember what they had learned the day before and they couldn't remember what they played the day before and they had no structure. They got no instruction and no knowledge to be able to apply it to make some steady circuits. It took the third group of people and they said, listen, don't even show up. Don't even create your day. Same thing, nothing happens. The last group of people, they said, listen, we want you to come two hours a day for two weeks. We're going to show you these one-handed exercises, but instead of you physically playing the piano, we want you to mentally rehearse over and over again those exercises. We know you're going to get tired, so we'll nudge you and we'll keep you awake, but you practice for two hours a day and you keep repeating those. The end of two weeks, they rescanned their brain and guess what happened? same area of the brain lit up as if they were actually playing the scales. Now you know what that means? They grew new circuits in their brain just by thinking about it, just by thinking, just by rehearsing. Now every time we learn something new, we make new circuits in the brain. If you learn anything new, learning is making a new connection in the brain, new neurological connection. Memory is maintaining or sustaining those connections keeping them alive. And the only way that we maintain and sustain connections in the brain is by repetition.